Namaste and welcome to the Festival of Bharat. This is your host, Pratyanshi Sharda. And the guest we have for today's show is Sri Ruchi Sharmaji. Ruchi Sharmaji is an international civil servant who has worked in constitutional and public policy reform in post socialist countries, environmental advocacy at the United Nations, and uh, the concept of neutrality in foreign policy alongside the roots of modern terrorism and extremism. Ruchi Ruchi, namaste and welcome to the show. Namaste. Thanks so much for inviting me. So, Ruchiji, uh, you are a vocal critic of uh, Western, specifically American imperialism. Uh, this is a new concept which hasn't really gained much of a momentum in the Indic discourse. So, what can you tell our viewers about this relatively unexplored topic uh, in the Indic wing? Well, I'm to be clear, against imperialism of all kinds, it's just uh, at the moment, the dominant form of imperialism is, let's say, Anglosphere imperialism. So not just the US, but uh, you know what we see as the West, but specifically the US, UK, and their uh, ecosystem of client states. So the unfortunate reality of the post Second World War world order and especially the post cold war world order is that the dominant hegemonic place of the uk as an imperial power was uh, taken over by the us and uh, they are the best students uh, of uh, the the old british empire as well and have learned from many of the structural weaknesses that the uh, British Empire uh, had. So the British Empire directly ruled its colonies, you know, be they in, um, in Asia or Africa, uh, whereas the modern form of imperialism is much more subtle. It's very rare to see some sort of uh, hegemonic power, colonial power, directly controlling territories uh, outside of its core metropole. Uh, instead, they manage uh, countries to turn them into what are called neo-colonies. So this is something that uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the first prime minister and also first president of Ghana, uh, wrote about. Uh, he called it neo-colonialism, and he said it was the final form of, uh, of imperialism. And in neo-colonialism, you have countries that they look independent, you know, they look sovereign, they have institutions, they have elections, they you know, uh, have this public facade of being independent, democratic. However, their political and especially economic decisions are made abroad, and there's just a native face to it. That happens in Latin America, it happens in Africa, it happens in Asia. Oh, all right. So you can say that this system of imperialism was a direct replacement of the early colonial practices that existed. Yes, it, it became uh, difficult. So difficult to explain to populations back home after the devastation of uh, World War Two. Why are we, you know, spending money on India and Kenya and Ghana when uh, London got bombed? You know, th there was a change in government. You know, they got Clement Attlee, the first Labour government. They started building a social welfare state for the first time in the UK. Uh, in France, they gave up their uh, colonial empire uh, because of internal restructuring, that they got a new republic, new constitution. So it went from the Fourth Republic to the Fifth Republic. They lost Algeria. And then they gave countries in West Africa a choice. You know, do you want to be part of the French community or do you want full independence? And uh, this was quite a poison chalice. You know, when the British gave independence, or when the French gave independence to their former colonies, it wasn't with a view to give them full independence. Uh, they would sabotage it internally to make sure that these countries remained economically colonies. And that's what's important. They should remain a source of cheap labor, a source of raw materials that you can then you know, import to France or to the UK or to the US and then add value, generate employment, you know, create uh, a big industrial economy, and then export it back to these countries as finished goods, as value added goods or as services. And that uh, you spend enough money to keep the local native elite 
in your good books, you educate them you know, in Paris, you educate them at Oxford and Cambridge and develop a symbiotic relationship with them. So that's neo-colonialism. And uh, you know, to give you an example of this, uh, I believe it was uh, Guinea in West Africa, when uh, the French uh, gave Guinea its independence, uh, Charles de Gaulle said to the leader of the independence movement, that uh, if you choose to become sovereign, you choose to become independent, I won't create an obstacle to it. You can, or you can be part of this federation of French territories. He said, no, I want to be uh, independent. Uh, my people demand uh, sovereignty. They were granted their independence, but the local uh, French uh, settlers, so the, the white French who were living in Guinea, mm -hmm. upon this uh, declaration, do you know what they did? No. They uprooted telephone lines, electric electricity poles, the sewage system, saying all of this was made by France for us, not for you. And they wow. sabotaged the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure, roads, you know, electricity, uh, telephones, uh, drainage, so that this country could not stand on its feet. And mm -hmm. so all of these countries in West Africa today, the Francophonie, uh, are they fully independent? Most of them are still managed by France. They're still remote control. That's neo-colonialism. And in the case of India or South Africa or, or Kenya, it's a much more sophisticated British form of uh, neo-colonialism. And uh, in Latin America, you have the American form. Okay, wow. So that's something new, I think, that our viewers will be getting to know. So with regards to India, like you said specifically, uh, how does Western, like you said, uh, British neocolonialism, right? So with regards to India, how does it work exactly? So what the British would do uh, was different to the French. Uh, generally, when they left a country, they would partition it so as to create a civil war and mm -hmm. so that uh, British lives would be saved. So, you know, they would uh, withdraw uh, British civilians and British military officers and then disrupt the, uh, the new country enough so that it would cripple itself through a civil war or through a border that was made to be unstable. Or in the case of Nigeria, by creating an artificial state with uh, so much ethnic trouble between the North and the South that it would be dysfunctional anyway. And this way, they pioneered this actually in Europe, in Ireland, that oh. when Ireland got its independence, Ireland was the first British colony to uh, achieve independence in uh, 1920, 1921. Uh, they didn't give all of Ireland independence. There were six districts in the north of Ireland, which remained the United Kingdom, which mm -hmm. were Protestant majority, while Catholic majority, uh, Ireland became the Irish Free State, which is now called the Republic of Ireland that has remained a source of great tension, mm -hmm. violence, political instability for now 100 years. And that was the, the first example. It worked so well for the British. They got what they wanted, that you know, they pretended to look like you know, this big magnanimous power that gives independence if you ask nicely, while <laughs> creating the conditions that would keep that country poor and unstable and dependent on them. So that happened there, it happened in Palestine, it happened in India, it uh, happened uh, not through direct British intervention, but non-intervention in Cyprus. So Cyprus was another colony, uh, a British colony in Europe, and uh, it was given independence, but with, uh, with conditions. So mm -hmm. there are two British military bases or naval bases in Cyprus, which are sovereign British territory. Even though it's on Cypriot land, it counts as Britain, Okay. And they also had a deal that uh, Cyprus would remain neutral and its independence would be guaranteed by uh, three countries, by mm -hmm. the UK, Greece, and Turkey. In 1974, Turkey attacked Cyprus and occupied half of it. They occupied the north half of this, uh, the country. Okay. The UK didn't intervene. What does that say? They wanted the country to be divided because then it's mm -hmm. easier to manage. Now Cyprus is no longer a meddlesome, neutral, non-aligned country. It's uh, been plagued by, you know, having lost half of its territory, being uh, ethnically cleansed in the north. And uh, there's an ar dif artificial division now between Greek Cypriots, Greek-speaking Cypriots, and Turkish-speaking Cypriots. 
Oh God! So you, we can say safely then uh, that the British and the Western powers ensured that the countries remained in a perpetual sense of tension and uh, disharmony even after they left. So, in your opinion, why why did they go to such extents to control and diminish the sovereignty of other nations? What could be the possible reason? Well, the reasons are pretty simple. They they still wanted to benefit economically from the arrangements that they had enjoyed for 100 years. And that is that their domestic economy is dependent on cheap raw materials from Latin America, Africa, and Asia, because those raw materials don't even exist in their country. Uh, they don't have forests anymore. They had coal, which helped them through the Industrial Revolution. But you know, do they have uh, uh, cobalt? Do they have aluminum? Do they have you know, any of the basics for 20th and 21st century economies? No, they don't. So they have to import it, but they don't want to pay the full market rate for it. You know, that's bad for business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to keep it as cheap as possible. And the best way to do that is to control the source. And uh, at the same time, if you can acquire a source of raw materials, you generally can also exploit cheaper labor costs there. So you can pay one tenth or you know one twentieth of what you would pay uh, domestically, and then you also acquire a market for your finished goods. And this is you know this mercantilism has not changed because it's about self-interest. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, no country has any real vision or ideology. It has self-interest, mm -hmm. and self-interest is what motivates uh, actors in international relations. So it's in self-interest of rich countries to remain wealthy. They don't like change. The current system worked very well for them. You know, if they're wealthy today, if they're stable today, it's because the world works in a way that was designed by them. It, they would never give that up you know, without a fight. So, you know, when they grant independence, you know, without a fight, when they weren't kicked out, physically kicked out by a revolutionary force, for example, the, uh, the Dutch were kicked out of Indonesia by uh, local resistance. Uh, that teaches them a lesson. The French were kicked out of Vietnam through violence, through an armed rebellion. Uh, oh, right. But in cases where they granted independence, then it's generally a false independence because it was set on their terms and they did what they needed to maintain their interests. And I think in, in the Indian case, we have, you know, we had a very brutal partition. And what did they get out of it? You know, we didn't get much out of uh, the partition. It was they who did because they got a very loyal client state in the mm -hmm. form of Pakistan, which was very pro-Western, which was open for business for uh, British uh, uh, military officers. For, so for many years after independence, Pakistan's air force was full of British officers. Their uh, army ha had British officers. Uh, and then they became a very reliable American client state. And why? Mm -hmm. They created a wonderful buffer state between India and the Soviet Union and Afghanistan, uh, which was quite pro-Soviet at the time as well, or was, they were worried it was going to become one. So with that, they got what they needed. They created chaos and civil war uh, in their former colony. Uh, the two countries have had four wars, so they keep each other busy. You don't need to... Uh, uh, worry about one of them becoming a regional superpower because whenever it gets too successful, uh, there's the you know client state that will cut them down to size. <laughs> oh, and so wonderfully explained. And if I were to ask a slightly related question, uh, which falls under the purview of Western imperialism. So uh, why do you think that India gets such a negative coverage by the Western press? And is this true for other post-colonial countries as well? Uh, it's true of most uh, post-colonial countries, uh, unless they are incredibly pliant and willing to be managed. Uh, so for example, you don't see as negative uh, portrayals of Pakistan or Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia or the Emirates. Uh, because they're seen as essential allies, you know, they share intelligence, they help counter extremism, you know, whatever that means. And uh, 
uh, there's uh, there's instructions. You know, don't go too hard on them. They're more useful alive than dead. You know, that oh, okay. uh, he, he might be a brutal dictator, but he's our brutal dictator. That's what they say <laughs> in Washington. Uh, same in Latin America. You know, they don't want to talk about Latin American dictators because they're you know generally trained and installed by the CIA. Uh, oh. With India, it's a unique case. Uh, so yes, you know, we face a lot of the negative courage that many other uh, uh, post-colonial countries face. For example, Kenya does not get positive coverage or South Africa does not receive positive coverage. But in the case of India, this negative co uh, coverage is more or less eternal. That, you know, oh, well, at least in modern times. Uh, you can trace a straight line for 200 years. The way India has been portrayed, has, there's no difference between 1820 or 1821 and 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, and why is that? It's because India is this wonderful blank canvas in which you can paint you know, your fears and hopes and aspirations for domestic politics uh, and use it to massage minds in the UK or in the US or in France. So examples of that are uh, so a friend of mine, Vishal Ganeshan, you know, he was mm -hmm. recently on this program as well. He runs an account called uh, Hindu History, so Hindu mm -hmm. with two O's, the archaic spelling. And he looks into the media archives in the U.S. to see mm -hmm. how India and Hindus were portrayed uh, in the 1800s. And what was fascinating was that generally portrayals of India were written by either people who had never set foot in India or by missionaries who went to civilize the heathens. So they had a certain interest uh, in portraying India a certain way. So the ones who had never been to India, they wrote about India in order to mobilize uh, public opinion for domestic political debates. So for example, uh, the US was founded by Protestants on Protestant principles. They saw their form of Republic to be unique and a unique product of Protestant genius. They would say Catholics, you know, Orthodox Christians, they don't have republics because they're semi-savage. They're semi-pagan. That's why they need a strong king to rule over them. Uh, that's why, you know, Italians, Spanish, you know, uh, Greeks, uh, uh, Russians, they're, you know, they're not really, you know, white, you know, they're not really civilized. Their, their values are incompatible with, uh, you know, the Republican ideal because that's, you know, that comes from Protestantism. And uh, as a result, uh, before you know, they had uh, you know, modern immigration, they had uh, immigrants from countries like Spain or Italy or Ireland or, uh, or Poland. They were seen as non-white because they were Catholic. And okay. you know, this community wanted the right to set up their own schools so Catholic run schools so that they could, uh, you know, be administered by priests and nuns, uh, you know, we're familiar with Catholic schools and convent schools in India as well. Mm -hmm. They wanted the right to do that in the US. And there was a big debate about that. So uh, it was a lot of public opinion about, uh, and it was reflected in the media and caressed and massaged in the media that, oh, this is terrible. This is the beginning of the end because all Catholics have a double loyalty to the Vatican and the Vatican is going to control the minds of children and they're going to be subversive. And they, because Catholics are semi-pagans, they're no, not really different to all these savage Indians. And they would give mm -hmm. examples like, oh, you know, uh, the Jagannath Puri Yatra. Uh, they would say, oh, the great chariot of Jagannath, it crushes babies and crushes all these savages and they scream mm. as the wheels crush them. And, uh, you know, it's so, you know, barbaric. And this will happen in the US if we let Catholics run their own schools. There was even a oh. cartoon uh, that was published, uh, so an, an illustration, which uh, was called The American Ganges. So there was a mm -hmm. river which was uh, portrayed to be like our Ganga, and there were uh, crocodiles coming out of it that represented Catholics, and uh, there were children on the uh, on the side of the bank uh, on the river bank. They were being protected by a brave Protestant uh, teacher, uh -huh. and in the back on the other side of the the American Ganges was the Vatican and uh, the buildings of Rome and the Vatican City. So they would use these narratives for domestic debates because India is a wonderful blank canvas. You can find you know, any reason 
uh, any argument, anything you want over there without any cost. You know, there's no one in India who's going to criticize them. There were no Indians in mm -hmm. India, uh, in the US at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the other uh, portrayals come from missionaries whose job it was to go to, uh, to India to civilize the savages. Now that mm -hmm. starts off with an assumption that everyone is uncivilized and everyone is savage. So then you have to uh, create that myth. So you have to first write about how uncivilized they are, how savage they are, and how their culture and their religion is wrong. Then you can mobilize money from back home, you can mobilize public sympathy and continue with your cause. That has not changed in 200 years. Maybe the debates are different, maybe the form of civilization they're trying to bring or what they're trying to cure us of has changed a little bit, but it's the same motivations they have. Interesting. So that process has not stopped. It's just continuing. So they're perpetuating the same religious, cultural hegemony that existed earlier on. Yes. And to add one more thing to it is that, you know, so we mentioned how some countries get away with it by being very reliable allies, being very pliant. Mm. Uh, India does not have that luxury because even if tomorrow, let's say the government changed, and we became super pro-American, super pro-Western, we did everything they asked for us, it would still not be enough because we're too big to be, you know, to be trusted. Uh, we're mm -hmm. not seen as a reliable ally. We're seen as a potential regional power. Nobody takes us seriously as a potential superpower, uh, but uh, we're seen as a potential regional uh, power and they don't want that. They don't want you to have your own ideas. They don't want you to have your own vision, your own foreign policy. They need states that do what they're told. And a messy, diverse, you know, democracy like India does not do what it's told. It has, you know, domestically people pulling it 10 different ways. And that's mm -hmm. reflected in its foreign policy that right now, we've been a sovereign country for 71 years, uh, and an independent country for even longer, for 74 years. Do we have the capacity to define, let alone defend our own interests, whether well, one country that doesn't even know what its self-interest is. So mm -hmm. when you haven't even demonstrated a capacity or ability or willingness to pursue your own self-interest or even define it in the first place, what good are you as an ally? You're useless. So, you know, first, they're never going to treat us, you know, with the same softness that they do the Saudis or uh, Pakistan, because we're not seen as uh, reliable. That's why in the long run, uh, even if we became very pro-American, it's not enough for them. Uh, they would rather have India balkanized into seven new countries. They can all be full of dictators. They can be run by dictators, have no human rights. They love that. Then mm -hmm. they'll say, oh, you know, look at the United States of Dravidia. What a wonderful <laughs> country. Uh, you know, look at uh, greater Bangladesh, you know, look at its economic mi miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see that, you know, uh, do you see negative coverage of Bangladesh in the Western media? Mm -mm. No. Do you see negative coverage of Pakistan in the Western media? No. Only occasionally now that they've become more pro-Chinese, but not in the 80s, not in the 90s, they were not in the 2000s. They were our frontline ally in the war against terror. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, that that's really interesting because uh, people generally tend to think that uh, this uh, negative coverage that India receives is because India it might be a strong competitor to the USA, but it uh, turns out that's not really the case it's because we can't really be trusted is that what can be deduced from this yeah we're not a competitor yet we're still a semi-colonial hmm. uh, economy you know and geopolitically we're nowhere you know we're not even at the level of iran or turkey geopolitically or diplomatically so we're not we're far from being a competitor to, to the us they don't take us seriously as a potential competitor they see the uh, the russians as competitors for historical reasons even though the russians don't really have the same uh, you know power projection that they did as the mm -hmm. soviet union and they see china as a competitor uh, india is you know is not a competitor, but also not a client state, also not a potential client state because it's not seen as reliable. And what's left, rogue state. Rogue state mm -hmm. like Venezuela or like Iran or like Syria 
uh, who you know you need to discredit constantly in uh, the Western media so that you manufacture consent for regime change. Mm -hmm. And that regime change, or you know, even worse, balkanization, as mm -hmm. was done in Yugoslavia. Yes. So then, uh, one of the best examples of how this works. So to combine, you know, the topics we're talking about, both neocolonialism, narrative control, and uh, you know, and uh, balkanization, is uh, is Yugoslavia. So okay. Yugoslavia is a country that's you know close to my interests. I started off my career working with uh, governments there and MPs there as an advisor. And uh, they, you know, were a country that was very close to India uh, diplomatically, but mm -hmm. also in terms of history and culture and uh, let's say political philosophies, that mm -hmm. uh, this was a country that uh, had reclaimed sovereignty after the Second World War in a new form. They mm -hmm. created a federalized system, you know, with uh, various federal states. Uh, uh, so Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, Macedonia, as it was called, uh, and uh, two autonomous regions as well. So Vojvodina and Kosovo. Now, this was a country that was socialist, but not part of the Soviet bloc. It was one of the founding countries of the non-aligned movement like India and Indonesia, uh, Ghana, uh, Egypt. And uh, like India, it played the role of a buffer state that it was not okay. seen as a reliable client state because it was you know, too wacky, too socialist, you know, had too many different uh, ethnicities. And even though there was a strong man leader in Josef Broz Tito, uh, they didn't see it, uh, Yugoslavia as a client state or a potential client state. Okay. Instead, they saw it as a buffer state that, okay, mm -hmm. there's this country which has you know, liberal rights and you know, uh, has a pretty good standard of life and is relatively uh, peaceful, but they're still you know, socialists. Uh, can't really trust them, but it's better than you know Romania, Bulgaria, uh, mm -hmm. you know Hungary on their borders. So let's work with them. So they mm -hmm. were actually quite well regarded in London and Washington. Uh, so you know the celebrities of the Western world would come on holiday to Tito's island. You know Queen Elizabeth herself would come over, uh, and uh, the country benefited from trade and especially investments from the oh, US. Right. So they welcomed investments, they welcomed loans and aid from the US. And in exchange, they kept their distance from the Soviet Union. And uh, they invested in infrastructure, they became uh, the country with the best standard of living in Eastern Europe. Uh, they had a lot of uh, trappings of success. You know, they had malls and escalators, you know, in the 60s when, you know, <laughs> many countries wow. didn't see those until the 90s or 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the 80s, uh, Tito passed away and a new generation of leaders came to power. But most importantly, Yugoslavia stopped being useful to the West as a buffer state when Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union and started making friendly noises that, oh, you know, I don't want a Cold War anymore. I'm restructuring domestically, Glasnost, Perestroika, you know, confidence building measures. And by the end of the 80s, uh, the Cold War was coming to a close uh, and the uh, Soviet bloc was being dismantled and was very happy to uh, become. Do you need a buffer state like Yugoslavia anymore? No. So they, the Americans started saying, okay, now it's time to pay back your loans. So all that aid we gave you, it wasn't for free. There were strings attached, pay it back. At the same time, they started doing subnational diplomacy and they, started, they through the West Germans, uh, told uh, the leadership of uh, so federal states like uh, uh, Croatia and Slovenia that look, you know, uh, you don't have to pay this, you know, you're so industrialized, uh, but uh, Belgrade, you know, builds these factories and spends all the money, you know, from factories and your industrial base in Ljubljana and Zagreb, they waste it on these peasants in, you know, in Bosnia and Macedonia. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to pay. It's the capital that has to pay. It's Belgrade that has to pay. It's Serbia that has to pay. If you declare independence, we'll give you diplomatic uh, recognition. We'll support you and you know, no, no debts. 
So <laughs> of course, you know, with that sort of guarantee, uh, it was wonderful for them to exit the uh, the federal uh, structure and go independent. And the roots of the civil war, of the disintegration of Yugoslavia, you know, there's this whole mythology around it. Oh, these incompatible savage Easterners, you know, uh, mm -hmm. these Orthodox Christians and Catholics and Muslims, they just can't get along because it's in their blood. That's nonsense. That's Orientalist garbage. It's, it's racist to say that. Okay. You know, these things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen because, you know, secessionism, separatism is very rarely organic. It happens mm -hmm. because foreign powers give some sort of support. It can be arms and military support. It can be diplomatic support. It can be financial support. That's mm -hmm. how it happens. And this is the sophisticated form of neocolonialism reserved for countries that are too big to be reliable or too diverse to be reliable. So you break them up and then you get seven reliable allies out of it instead of one country that thinks it's a you know, moral authority or a regional power. So that's something that if we're going into a new Cold War between the US and China, India has to remember that we're not going to be accepted as, you know, an American ally, uh, mm -hmm. because allyship means that they'll come to our defense. They will not sacrifice a single of their troops to defend mm -hmm. Indian sovereignty. It's still us who have to do it. And uh, so they're not going to commit to a full allyship. We're going to be a strategic partner, but the risk of being a strategic partner is exactly this, to what happened to, to Yugoslavia, that we act as a buffer state that happens to share a big border with, uh, with the People's Republic of China. And as soon as we stop being useful, as soon as they you know, figure out some peace between them, then uh, you know, they still have all of these techniques on hand. And you can see it now. You can see all sorts of, you know, nascent separatist uh, movements gaining traction, and they live off the oxygen of foreign support. Very, very fascinating. So uh, another question that I had in mind is, uh, why exactly, like you said, that India is too big and too um, uh, diverse to be trusted as an ally state? So. Uh, this middle ground between uh, an ally and a rogue, no, not a rogue state, an ally and um, a competitive state. So what is that exactly? Could you just explain it once? So ideally, you know, if we want to survive, you know, another 70 years, so we have 70 years of a sovereign, or at least a semi-sovereign, you know, newly forming bipolar, you know, once again, new Cold War world, then we have mm -hmm. to learn to be transactional in our foreign policy. It's not enough to just be happy mm -hmm. when, you know, the U.S. pays attention to us that, oh, you know, we mm -hmm. got included in the club or they promised to give us a seat on the U.N. Security Council. That's the biggest joke of all because, you know, they dangle it in front of us like a carrot. But uh, the truth is they're not going to give India a, a permanent seat with a veto at the Security Council. They're just going to give us uh, you know, second grade status. So the reform plan is not to expand the P5. The mm -hmm. original five will still be permanent members and have a veto. And then they'll add, you know, India, or they'll add Germany, they'll add Japan as permanent members without a veto. That's useless. Okay. That's just making the Security Council uh, more chaotic mm -hmm. and uh, more of a playground for the P5 to uh, to use others. So that's a, a dream that's not even really worth having. Uh, what we should be doing is defining what our national interest is and pursuing mm -hmm. it. And pursuing it means, you know, you set a goal and you embrace any method to achieve it. Uh, and that can mean sometimes working together with the US. It can mean sometimes working together with uh, China. It can, you know, what matters is that you're pursuing your interests and you're exacting a cost from it. So for example, at the moment, we've been included in the quad. Mm -hmm. And we're just, you know, our media, you know, seems happy. Oh, we've been included in the quad. That means things are changing. That means, you know, daddy USA is going to save us. No. And also because if you look at the statements that are issued with by the quad, I don't see any Indian interests being represented there. 
it's all you know American, Japanese, and Australian interests that are being pushed as agendas. Uh, does does the Quad ever talk about the Indo-Tibetan border? Does it talk mm -hmm. about the skirmishes that we have with the People's Liberation Army? Does mm -hmm. it talk about the uh, the disputed border? Does it talk about uh, Chinese ownership of media or you know affiliations of political parties within the country? No. So you know what are we get, getting out of it except from the warm apart from a warm feeling inside that we've been included? That's you know that's what needs to change. That we need to you know demand a price for our cooperation. That we can't just let them think that oh you know look at this country it has a, an army of a million people if we throw them a bone once in a while the mm -hmm. attack dog will bite the chinese you know what kind of role is that is that you know what a sovereign country you know with a rich civilizational history should be should we be the you know attack dog of uh, a superpower that oh this way you know they don't have to sacrifice their troops to china mm -hmm. because you know we're doing it anyway because of mm -hmm. our border issues that's very unfortunate and you need a much bolder foreign policy vision that this is what you know you have to establish this is what india is about this is our ideology this is our vision this is our goal for the next 100 years and you know, diplomacy foreign policy domestic policy all is channeled by that at the moment india never defined it after independence did we define you know what you know india's vision is what india's purpose is what our self-interest is did we define what the social contract is you know between the state and the citizen not really and as a result we have state institutions that don't have an identity don't have a vision don't have an ideology don't have a a long-term set of goals now without goals uh if you don't have goals to pursue what do you have you just have means you just have methods and that's what we're stuck doing the indian state for 70 years is still worshiping the methods that it learned uh, during the British Raj. And the only definition that I've seen, if you ask, you know, what does independent India mean? They just mean is say, oh, it's not Pakistan. So that's a negationist view. You know, I don't care what it's not. Tell me what it is. What what does India mean? And they'll be like, no, it's a secular country. It's like it disproves the two nation uh, theory. No, look, you recognize Pakistan as an, a sovereign country. You maintain uh, uh, diplomatic relations with them. That mm -hmm. means you've accepted the two nation theory. End of story. You know, the, the existence of India as a secular state does not disprove it. Uh, you have to define what it is apart from it not being Pakistan or not a Hindu Pakistan. The country was divided based on religion, own it and build from there. But otherwise, the trauma, the sacrifice, the suffering of all those people who kill, were killed during partition or during the uh, mm -hmm. run up to partition as well in Noakali or in direct action day. It's meaningless unless you give some meaning to that uh, sacrifice that they didn't die for nothing. At the mm -hmm. moment, they died for nothing. The memory is forgotten by the state deliberately because the state lacks uh, vision. And, and that's something, it doesn't matter who you, know, you elect every five years uh, to manage the state, the rot is in the institutions that the bureaucracy, police, judiciary are all uh, legacies of the colonial state. They were designed not to serve citizens, they were designed to manage conflict with the natives and protect mm -hmm. uh, themselves. So all we have is a self-perpetuating, the idea of India just means a self-perpetuating elite. So it's an elite reproduction scam uh, that insulates uh, the institutions from the consequences of their own policies. That is something that has to change you know, fundamentally. Very interesting. So yes, I mean, do you see any changes happening now? Um, no, not really. Uh, all I see at the moment are, is incrementalism, the you know, trying to improve the delivery of you know, welfare, which is, you know, which is good in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's short-termism, that mm -hmm. uh, when the structure is, designed to keep people you know, weak or dependent on the state, then you know, making it more efficient while good in the short term doesn't solve the issue of why people are poor, why they're desperate, why they're dependent. So you have to imagine a radical 
reform of the constitution, of the judiciary, of the police, of the bureaucracy. And hmm. that vision has, uh, has not come forth so far uh, from any, uh, any government uh, uh, was best in, uh, personified by a few movements in the 70s. So in the 70s, okay. you had the Nav Nirman uh, Andolan in Gujarat, and you had the Sampurna Kranti in uh, Bihar, and then throughout the country, so total revolution, which called for the decolonization of institutions or the replacement of these uh, Nehruvian British Raj institutions with what they said, you know, why was it some porn country? Why was it total revolution? Because it was not just political, it was political, social, economic, spiritual, moral, it was about the revivalism of the country, building it up in the image of its people. Now, at the moment, because our constitution is seen as a gift of the British or, or you know, uh, at least that's how the West sees it. They act mm -hmm. like the custodians of it and their native agents uh, behave in that same arrogant manner that the constitution mm. is holy it's this holy book because it's full of these copy pasted western ideas and it's important for us to have that because that's how we as the native elite get respect uh when we leave the uh, the country he you know uh, says we're not equal we're honorary whites but mm. the values of the constitution you know do not reflect the values of the people or the aspirations of the people and mm -hmm. generally you know, countries that had these semi-colonial uh, constitutions, reformed them within a generation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, Sri Lanka did it. So Sri Lanka has had four constitutions. They were, you know, had a Dominion constitution in 48. Uh, then they had uh, a Republican constitution uh, a few years later with a Westminster style uh, a democracy like India. So parliament, prime minister and a figurehead president. And then in 1978, they threw it out and became a presidential uh, republic. So with hmm. the directly elected uh, president, with a reformed uh, parliament, unicameral, no federalism to prevent separatism. So you know, central government and uh, uh, districts, no middleman, no regional satraps. And uh, they also uh, uh, encoded Buddhism as their state religion. Uh, so Article 9 of the Sri Lankan constitution says that uh, the state religion of Sri Lanka is Buddhism, and it is the duty of the state to ensure uh, Buddhist shasan. So, you know, a wise administration or Buddhist administration. Now, that is not incompatible with giving other religions rights. Mm -hmm. There are many countries that have a state religion, yeah, even in our neighborhood. So Bangladesh also, you know, is uh, both uh, a secular country and has uh, Islam as its state religion. So you know, it's uh, uh, first among equals. So other religions and their communities all have the same rights. So you know they solve their secularism dilemma organically uh, based on the values of the, the people. Ghana is another example that uh, when Ghana got its independence, uh, Nkrumah, their prime minister, uh, soon saw that the constitution they got was uh, designed to cripple them. It was designed to mm. prevent radical change. It was designed to prevent any challenge to the economic and geopolitical relations that the British enjoyed with their foreign uh, former colonies. So he created a referendum to abolish the constitution and replace it with a presidential form of government. And uh, he then transitioned from being the first prime minister to the first president. And mm. there was clear separation of powers then that the president is the head of the executive Parliament is, you know, for making laws, and the judiciary is for uh, judicial oversight. So now that's something that uh, we unfortunately missed our chance. That uh, there was a movement for this in the 70s, but uh, why did the emergency take place? So Indira Gandhi imposed the emergency because she said there was an internal threat to the country. The mm -hmm. internal threat to the country was Moraji Desai's Navnirman and mm -hmm. uh, Jayaprakash Narayan's Sampoorn Kranti because they were the mass movements that were demanding this sort of change. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
unfortunately, during the emergency, we saw you know certain uh, amendments to the constitution, the dubious ones, so the 42nd amendment pushed through. You know when the opposition was in prison, and uh, Indira Gandhi also had some you know a vision. She said uh, uh, she wanted to build a state with a committed bureaucracy, committed judiciary, committed uh, uh, press, and committed means committed to the objectives of the party. Uh, so not independent judiciary, independent press. Uh, so there was so much damage done to the constitution in, uh, during the emergency that even after the emergency ended and the remnants of Sampoon Kranti created the Janta Party Alliance and came to power under Moraji Desai, they came to power promising the moon that they would undo every amendment made to the constitution during the emergency, that mm -hmm. they, would, uh, they would blacklist uh, uh, historians that had been placed by the CPI uh, to distort NCRT, to distort uh, JNU, to distort syllabuses, UPSC, mm -hmm. remove them and remove their works from the syllabus. Uh, they, they even proposed, together with Sri Lanka, that the Red Cross in India should be renamed uh, Red Swastik, because it's the Red Crescent in the Islamic world, uh, mm -hmm. Red Cross in the Christian world. So Sri Lanka and India had a joint proposal at uh, the uh, International uh, Red Cross in Geneva to rename mm -hmm. it Red, uh, Red uh, Swastik in these two countries. So mm -hmm. that was quite radical. None of it actually happened. The government only lasted 20 months. And the oh. constitution is designed in such a way that uh, doesn't matter if you want a historic mandate in the lower house. Uh, that's not enough to change the constitution. It's not enough to amend it or even undo the amendments. So we have a very conservative constitution. There's, you know, there's these judges who are like, oh, yeah, it's a living, breathing document. And it's like this <laughs> wonderful, magical document that gives social justice and rights uh, where there was nothing <laughs> before. That's not the case. It's a rigid conservative document that uh, uh, they think achieved perfection during the emergency and now is impossible to change. And that, that's you know, made by this basic structure doctrine and the uh, difficulty in repealing the amendments of uh, the emergency era. Quite true. So we can say that there is a total decolonization of Indian institutions that is very imminent and that should be uh, executed very well. So in your opinion, which particular key areas need this special attention in uh, with regards to decolonization and what are the generic steps that can be taken to assure that? So, as I mentioned before, bureaucracy, judiciary, police reforms, and also educational reforms. These, these are the four legacies of colonialism that mm -hmm. still persist, that uh, we haven't questioned, that we haven't sought to reform. And even when it, uh, there has been a question of reform, it's just been tiny reforms. So, uh, the uh, administrative reforms, instead of uh, reimagining what the uh, bureaucracy should be like is just uh, oh you know we'll allow some lateral entry that's not enough uh, and the problem with that is that the state still has this colonial mentality uh, of the maibap you know feudal arrangement wherein government jobs are not f uh, designed to pursue government policy they are a form of patronage that the big feudal lord occasionally throws to a few subjects to buy their loyalty. So you, you know, make sure that X, Y, Z from ABC community is represented, they got a government job, and that will keep them quiet for a few years. And because that's uh, just the standard operating procedure, uh, they can't they can't think big enough outside of the box to dismantle it because this is the system that got them to power and this is the system they rely on now to stay on power so nobody you know when you when they've climbed up a ladder to reach the the roof they don't kick the ladder away mm -hmm. because you know they they worship the ladder because oh yeah the, the ladder is you know what uh, gave us this power but they forget that uh, power is just a method the goal of power of acquiring power is to create change, to create the kind of change in society that you want to see. So that's something that needs to be done, that uh, uh, in terms of you know, the bureaucracy, it needs to be professionalized. It's, uh, it's, not a, you know, uh, it's not 
conducive to the aspirations of the people that people that uh, you can give an exam and then have a guaranteed job for life and you know be insulated from the commoners you know mm -hmm. even the the privileges that uh, government officials get they're a legacy of uh, colonial times and in, in other countries a bureaucrat you know rents his or her own apartment with their own salary and lives among the people and takes public transport and has to deal with the consequences of their mm. uh, their policies uh, in india this you know ias is a or oh, the entire civil services are a continuation of you know what was designed for british officers uh, to protect them from the subjects that's why they have special neighborhoods to live in that's why they have an army of servants uh, so these feudal colonial privileges need to be dismantled as well as the sense of entitlement that comes from just passing an exam and uh, uh, becoming a you know tenured government official so shorter contracts uh, lateral hiring direct hiring uh, or specific uh, exams and requalification uh, requirements for uh, government posts is important. Uh, with police, uh, a switch for, to community policing is essential. So at the moment, uh, the police uh, engages in what's called barracks policing. So they sit at the police station, wait for something bad to happen. Then you go there and say, oh, sir, you know, and you go there with great fear, like, you know, uh, Working class or middle class people don't want to go to the police station because you know, they're not they're worried about what will happen to them, you know, who's raising mm -hmm. the complaint. So, you know, the police sit in the Thana, they wait for a crime to happen, then you know, uh, you tell them that the crime happens, it's noted, and then you know, it, there's no incentive for them to prevent the crime or you know. Uh, address it. It's just like, okay, you know, it's been noted. Now we need to go find the guy who did it and beat him up a bit. And, you know, oh, yes, problem solved. You know, we uh, help the natives. You know, uh, now that's unfortunate. That's not uh, serving the community. Mm -hmm. uh, community policing means being engaged within society. So, you know, being on patrol, uh, keeping an eye out on changes in the community, preventing crime, talking to people and understanding who's at risk of becoming a criminal, who's at risk of being radicalized, uh, being embedded within society instead of being, you know, this scary outpost of semi-militarized government authority that everyone mm. is scared of except the criminals. So you know, if that's what the essence of police reform is. We also need more uh, female police uh, officers uh, in order to build more trust uh, uh, with uh, the communities that they serve. Uh, then judicial reforms, uh, I don't even know where to begin with judicial <laughs> reforms. Uh, those, you know, uh, ideally, so uh, this is tied to constitutional reforms as well. Uh, mm -hmm. We should also be looking at uh, accelerating the um, conditions for a second republic like Ghana did or like uh, um, uh, Sri Lanka did. And uh, dream big, you know, create a new form of governance that is mm -hmm. active both at the grassroots and at the central level. At the moment, we have a weak central government no matter how many seats it has, uh, it's still dependent on states for implementation because of the state list and the concurrent list. Mm -hmm. We have very strong states, which is you know, perfect fodder for subnational diplomacy and for balkanization. And then mm -hmm. we have useless local authorities, which half of most of them only existed after 1991 or so 92 with the Panchayati Raj institutions that were institu institutionalized that uh, they don't have any power that you know they're just uh, a popularity context uh, within you know the village level or a front first party to do fundraising at in city municipalities so that has to change you need a strong fe uh, federal government a strong central government and you need strong local uh, government to mm -hmm. take care of delivery you can cut out the middleman so you know what i suggest is uh, that uh, India has a rich tradition of grassroots democracy from the bottom up, mm -hmm. and we should embrace that. Uh, so we should dissolve the current set of sta states and designate, we have 740 districts, designate them as states, so as Janpads. So you have central government and then 740 Janpads. And these Janpads 
don't need to have a, a legislature of their own. One hmm. nation, one law. Uh, but they should have their own executive head. They can have a you know cabinet uh, of uh, you know of ministers. So they they need an executive hmm. uh, and in charge of uh, you know education delivery, healthcare delivery, uh, electricity, you know uh, policing, security, and with that, we also need to decentralize our police and our uh, judiciary. So at the central level, the Supreme Court should be split into a constitutional court that deals only with, you know, is X law constitutional when it was passed? Yes or no. Uh, and a court of final appeal, which you go to when you've exhausted every other uh, court. At the Janpad level, you need to have a system of decentralized uh, uh, courts that function in the language of the local people. Hmm that uh, then allow people to get justice you know, in a timely and efficient manner. We should also have alternate dispute uh, settlement uh, mechanisms. So you know, without needing to involve uh, judges or lawyers to have a system of arbitration so that uh, cases that don't need to appear in front of courts can be resolved you know, in advance. And then, you know, if uh, you didn't get justice at the Janpad level, you can go to the uh, court of final appeal. Similarly, with the police, there should be you know, a federal police that is in charge of counter extremism, counter terrorism, mm. and uh, national security. So, you know, fighting Naxals, uh, for example, who have, you know, specialized training. Uh, mm. And at the community level, you should have, so at the Janpad level, you should have community policing that, you know, uh, force which is designed to prevent crime which has you know incentives and structures designed for crime prevention and uh, you can also divide that into a crime prevention wing and a crime investigation wing so one prevents crimes from happening and the other deals with the crimes that do take place so these are the kind of reforms we need to be thinking about uh, at the moment uh, there hasn't been enough appetite on that it's just been about uh, tinkering with the current system to make it a bit more human, a bit more friendly, a bit more efficient. But uh, that was good, you know, in 2014, 15. But now looking at how the world is changing and looking at the leaps that uh, you know, our neighbor in China is taking with the kind of uh, changes that uh, artificial intelligence is going to uh, create, we have to equip ourselves for this new world, for a new Cold War, for uh, more automation, for mm -hmm. a change in the entire socioeconomic basis of, uh, of society. So we have to, in other words, future-proof ourselves, prepare for the future. And uh, the current set of institutions are not suited for that. So one way or another, they're going to change. And it's best if we change them ourselves at our own pace by creating momentum from the grassroots, by putting pressure on you know, parliament to push this sort of change. Because mm -hmm. if we don't change it at our own pace, It'll happen anyway at someone else's pace. It'll happen, mm -hmm. you know, through civil war. It'll happen through some sort of catastrophic collapse. Uh, the point is, when institutions are so ill-suited for society, society moves forward whether the institutions want it or not. Mm -hmm. Now the okay. question is, will we take it with us, or will we pull the rug from under it, or someone else might pull the rug from under it? Quite, I mean, really insightful points you, you make, Rajivji. So, um, quite true, because yes, uh, a decolonization of institutions need to happen and they need to happen soon enough because we're squandering away time and uh, that will just add to the list of problems we already face. So, uh, if I were to ask you uh, something on a related note that about the decolonial movement that is catching up. So, how are the decolonial movements that were spearheaded, like you said, in Ghana by Kwame Nkrumah and uh, also in other African states uh, that were spearheaded by leaders like Thomas Sankara, how uh, are these uh, visions of pan Africanist movements similar to the decolonial line of thought that has now emerged in India? So, the, you know, the point of uh, decolonization is the assertion that the people of uh, a 
colonial territory or a former colonial territory have the right to be a sovereign state and to mm -hmm. define that sovereign state's uh, polity for themselves. Now, that is something that we have not experienced because the West still sees us as a semi-colony. China mm -hmm. still sees us as a semi-colony. We ourselves, our state institutions treat us like subjects and they're like the colonial masters. Now that's an issue. Uh, and we've seen it you know, in pretty much any country that has dealt with the trauma of uh, colonization. The post-colonial era led to uh, this realization that independence is not real until you have full sovereignty and you can uh, make laws, enforce them, uh, restructure your economy, restructure your uh, society to undo the harm that colonialism has done and do all of these things without the interference of a foreign power, especially of your former colonizer. Mm -hmm. Now, even in, uh, in Africa, you know, there were uh, countries that had bold visions like this. So like you mentioned, you know, in Ghana, there was Nkrumah, the, in um, Burkina Faso, there was Thomas Sankara. Uh, unfortunately, both of those leaders were deposed uh, because they uh, created changes that uh, the former colonial masters didn't like. So <laughs> Nkrumah was uh, deposed and then exiled. Well, uh, Thomas Sankara, a very interesting uh, person. Uh, so he was a captain in the, uh, in the army of what was then called Upper Volta or Ot Volta. Uh, and uh, he took power in a military coup d'etat and renamed the country to Burkina Faso, the land of upright men. So they called mm -hmm. him the upright man and uh, created grassroots uh, reforms in terms of vaccinations, in terms of women's empowerment, in terms of access to healthcare, education, literacy, uh, by creating bold new institutions that were mm -hmm. rooted in the culture of the people. And, and that's what's important, that it can't be a top-down process. Or even if it is a top-down process, it has to create the conditions that gives people the tools to make their own destinies, to pull themselves out of poverty, to pull themselves out of uh, the structural you know, dehumanization or the uh, structural uh, demoralization that they experienced during colonial times. Mm. Uh, so Sankara is very interesting because he was only in power for three or four years before he was assassinated, but he achieved reforms that other countries took decades, or in our case, you know, have not even happened so far because the political willpower was there, and you know, uh, he saw that uh, he dreamed that dream, and and uh, to use his phrase, invented the future. So, you know, a famous quote of his says that, uh, you know, you can't uh, keep yourselves locked in a box based on, you know, the way things are right now. Uh, you, you know, you can't uh, keep yourselves locked in uh, a cage because the, uh, uh, the colonizer made it for you. Mm -hmm. You have to invent the future. You have to create, you know, what you want to see and then uh, pursue the means to, uh, to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what we can learn from these Pan-Africanist uh, leaders who uh, created their own indigenous ideologies. And, and you saw it elsewhere as well. So Kenneth Kaunda in, in uh, Zambia or um, Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya. Uh, you had uh, Julius Nyerere in uh, Tanzania. So they created you know, African socialism or Ujama or you know, created a new ideology that was, you know, it wasn't just copy pasting uh, Marxism from the Soviet Union or liberalism from uh, the French Revolution or American War of Independence or Westminster mm -hmm. democracy from London, but you know, inventing or, you know, creating or building upon a rooted system of governance uh, to create a new polity that uh, reflected the values of the people. That's something that we need to learn from them. And uh, even within Asia, our own neighbors have done that as well. Do you see anyone in, uh, in Sri Lanka or in Bangladesh or Pakistan uh, missing the constitution that they got you know, in the 40s and 50s? You know, are they all like, oh, you know, it's so terrible that we got rid of it? No, they've uh, restructured their polities multiple times. Bangladesh mm -hmm. exists because they had a problem with the constitution of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the creation of Bangladesh, the Mukti Bahini, the uh, revolution they had, the war of independence they had, that is a form of radical decolonization. 
uh, or uh, in a peaceful manner, Sri Lanka's new constitution. Uh, now, every country you know defines its goals differently, uh, and you know I'm not saying that that way is the the right way for us. But what we need to acknowledge is that the people are sovereign, not the constitution, not the values of the elite. And you know, even the preamble says, you know, we the people of India have resolved to create a sovereign democratic republic. That means, you know, the people come first. The sovereignty comes from people. So they have the right to define what their polity should be. Mm -hmm. They have the right to demand a state that reflects their values and to demand institutions that serve them. Mm -hmm. Surely, surely. And uh, hopefully we'll see these changes coming soon, but we can't really say for sure, can we? Because uh, things are really uncertain right now. And uh, if we take into account the current situation we are witnessing, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. So all we can do is hope. Well, if we look at it in a different way, the uh, experiences over the past year and a half or two years, be it with the coronavirus or mm -hmm. with the anti-CAA uh, movement or with uh, separatism, uh, has been an eye-opener for many people. That mm -hmm. they see now the weaknesses of the current institutions and the colonial nature of the state that uh, you know, it doesn't matter what the intentions of the managers are, uh, the tools are not designed to work the way that the people expect them to or want them to. And that uh, is a disillusionment that could either make people bitter mm -hmm. or it can teach them to demand something more. That it's not enough to just get our guy elected to power uh, when the entire apparatus is designed to perpetuate a certain you know, set of values or a certain uh, hierarchy mm -hmm. between ruler and rule. So it's a, an eye opener and hopefully more people will start talking about the need to take control of our own destinies as a country, as, as people, as a civilization and build, boldly dream of and build and demand the kind of state that provides some sort of vision, some mm -hmm. sort of identity and some sort of social contract that at the moment, what does the Indian state actually do for the ordinary citizen? Does it protect him or her from physical harm? No, because the police is not capable of protecting every person. You know, they, their job is to, you know, handle violence or, you know, promote harmony, not to actually protect individual citizens. Uh, does the state protect your private property from being appropriated by someone else? No, you know, all it can offer is, you know, 20 years in court fighting a case and which you still lose because the other person is politically connected. Uh, mm -hmm. Does the state guarantee you certain rights, you know, the right to free speech? No, basically anything you say can be construed as illegal because of the First Amendment. It's funny, you know, the, all our constitution worshippers, uh, they, they love the American Constitution and, you know, they can quote uh, what the First Amendment, Second Amendment are. But uh, so in the, in the US, the First Amendment guarantees people uh, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. In India, the First Amendment took away our freedom of speech. Uh, and uh, a malicious uh, government can misconstrue anything as illegal mm -hmm. and lock you up. So we don't have freedom of speech. Uh, it's not that it's limited, we don't have it. Uh, then do we have uh, freedom of religion? No. Do we have equal rights for equal citizens? No. Do we have uh, uh, the right to protect ourselves from uh, foreign colonialism? No, in fact, we roll the red carpet out for them and treat them like gods. So, you know, what social contract do we have? So uh, regardless of what, you know, what you or I think, or what you and I even say in this uh, uh, conversation, it doesn't change the fact that at the grassroots for the ordinary uh, citizen, this is the current status quo. And as they are lifted up economically, once they are no longer desperate and dependent 
on others, you know, for their financial or economic security or their food security, they will demand this change because it's mm -hmm. unacceptable that this neo-feudal semi-colonial status quo has been maintained mm -hmm. and it's only changing now, not because uh, the government wants it or the institutions want it, uh, it's happening now because the genie was let out of the bottle in the 90s through liberalization and globalization. And now we're experiencing economic growth and mm -hmm. poor people are being lifted into lower middle class, low, lower middle class are being lifted into the middle class. And with that, then they have the social capital and the economic stability to demand more. And mm -hmm. that, you know, is a historical process that you or I or even the government can't control. It happens anyway. It happens whether we want it or not. So we should prepare for it. And we should create a state that serves them rather than letting frustrations boil and boil and boil until it gets out of control. Very true, very rightly said. So yes, that definitely should happen. And we'll be quite excited if it does, because let's see how long it takes since right now it uh, the situations are quite difficult so it might take time but at the moment it does it will definitely bring about a huge positive feedback from the public itself so uh Ruchi Ji, some uh, something that i really wish to ask you that is in the minds of uh, quite a few of our viewers is uh, does the western paradigm of left and right wing apply to the Indian context? No, it, it doesn't apply to the Indian context. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even apply to the context of uh, non-English speaking countries. It okay. only works in the Anglosphere. Uh, in the way that it's used by the Anglosphere mm -hmm. media, it only applies there. Because even if they go to France or to Germany, or you know, let's say Eastern Europe, it stops working because okay parties don't fit the traditional left-right dichotomy of a two-party system that mm -hmm. countries like the UK or the US or Australia and New Zealand have. So they have a very simplistic political uh, system where they think they have one left-wing party, one right-wing party. What they actually have is one center-right party and one hard-right <laughs> party. So they, okay. they've killed off their left a long time ago. There's no left-wing mm -hmm. that exists in the English-speaking world. Uh, so as a result, they think li liberalism, which is the center-right ideology, is leftism, and uh, conservatism is rightism uh, or neoconservatism. And uh, they then, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, they love to see other societies as a blank canvas in which they can paint their mm -hmm. own fears and aspirations and use it as a lesson or as a coping mechanism for their own public to guide them a certain way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when the Western media reports on uh, another country, and that can be India, it could be France, it could be Russia, Ukraine, Tunisia, uh, South Africa, they, you know, write with a certain agenda in mind. So mm -hmm. they're not writing for the people in those countries. You know, mm. people in Russia or South Africa already understand how their politics work. These <laughs> uh, outlets are... Uh, creating an explanatory guide for someone who doesn't have the time, interest, or energy to learn more about these countries. Mm -hmm. What they want to know is who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, and who is my guy? That, you know, if I'm a Democrat, <laughs> who, who are the Democrats of Russia? Who are the Democrats of India? Or if mm -hmm. I'm a Republican, who are the Republicans of South Africa? Who are the mm -hmm. Republicans of Italy? And mm. you know, they, they signal that by using this left-right terminology. Mm -hmm. But if you look at uh, parties outside the English speaking world, it's really difficult to define them as uh, you know, left or right by this Anglophie, uh, Anglosphere definition. Uh, so in France, for example, mm -hmm. where the left-right paradigm started off, uh, the historical uh, background to it is quite interesting that uh, it was based on which faction sat where in parliament and the, uh, the right wing were the conservatives who wanted to preserve uh, the privileges of the feudal elite, mm -hmm. while the left wing were those who wanted to radically reform society and rebuild it in the image of the people. Mm 
-hmm. Now, if you use this definition, the original definition of left and right in India, the Congress is a right wing party. It's a conservative party that exists <laughs> to maintain the, uh, the current system, the current socioeconomic relations that uh, we see in society, mm -hmm. while the BJP is a radical force that wants to re uh, transform society. That's written on their website, on their manifesto as well. They'll say, oh, you know, mm -hmm. our grand transformation of uh, Indian society and the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so is the left. So both the BJP and the left front would be considered left wing by that uh, terminology. If mm -hmm. we look at the modern terminology in the Anglosphere world and apply it to other countries in Russia, there's a party called the uh, Communist Party of the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. They are pro-welfare state, mm -hmm. but anti-immigration hardcore Russian nationalists, but <laughs> believe in nationalization of industry and don't like privatization. Okay. Are they left wing or right wing? <laughs> are they left wing because they have communists in the name or are they right wing because they, you know, wave the flag and, uh, and uh, love nationalism? Uh, you have uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, mixtures. You have, you know, unique political systems, unique political philosophies in different countries. And all, there's almost no party that neatly fits into the two party left right uh, paradigm outside the English speaking world because they have different needs. They didn't have mm -hmm. the same history. Uh, we're not a settler colony like Australia or Canada or the US that was you know, built upon exterminating the natives and then building your utopia from scratch. Uh, there you know, was a different history. We are the colonized. So all of our uh, all of our political philosophies emerged as a response to colonization, be it mm -hmm. Turkish, Mughal, British, Portuguese, French, Danish. And it, our polity will reflect that. So all of our uh, parties in India are economically left-wing. They're all socialists. There's no hardcore neoliberal saying privatize everything, 10% uh, flat rate tax, tax for everyone for corporates and for income tax, open up the country to uh, foreign imports. They're all pretty protectionist. Uh, they might privatize one or two companies, but they're not going to do what Poland or Russia did in the 90s and just uh, sell everything to mm -hmm. investors. Uh, all of them have a strong uh, social welfareist component, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, out of genuine concern for the public or because it's a form, again, of patronage that, you know, if you throw a few bones to people, then they'll be loyal. Uh, so, yeah, economically, they're all left wing. Socially, okay. all Indian parties are right wing. <laughs> they, they're all socially conservative. Uh, none of them, you know, are interested in uh, in you know lgbt issues for example you know that you know was in parliament that was in the courts uh, nobody was uh, willing no party was willing to stick their heads out and say oh we support it wholeheartedly mm -hmm. because there isn't a market for it mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a market for you know woke performative uh, activism either mm -hmm. because these things are or, or you know, even let's say liberalism, you know, liberal values, free speech, you know, you want absolute free speech, you could create a party and say, oh, I stand for free speech, low taxes, uh, and uh, social liberalism, LGBT rights, and, you know, uh, equal marriage, uh, nobody would vote for it. You know, it's still a reflection of the people, you know, uh, there aren't that many people who uh, would vote for right-wing economics in India, uh, in India, and not that many people who would work uh, vote for left-wing social policy. People are still mm -hmm. very closely tied to their social identities, and would rather see that reflected in society than for it to be reformed by force. So every social movement needs to arise from the grassroots, trying to impose it because another country is doing it, because your colonial master is doing it, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, values that we've imported mm -hmm. in our constitution or in our public imagination among the English speaking elite in a few metro cities, uh, these are luxuries of rich countries that, mm -hmm. you know, they were brutal dictatorships and uh, genocidal colonial states mm -hmm. when they were rising. And then once they became wealthy, then they, you know, had allowed you know, debates around this. 
around, uh, let's say, social liberalism, uh, about mm -hmm. free speech or uh, uh, secularism and the like. Now, we have an economy, you know, at, with the per capita income level of Mauritania, uh, but uh, we try to have debates, you know, to keep up, you know, our honorary white status in the West. We try to have the kind of debates that Canada or New Zealand or mm -hmm. uh, Norway have. That's a recipe for failure. I mean, if there's well-intentioned people who want to create a right-wing economic party, they should, and a left-wing social party, they should. You can even make them together. You know, in Europe, that's called a liberal party. So a party mm -hmm. that's that's a hardcore right-wing on economics, but you know, sprinkles some you know human face so, uh, uh, you know equality and justice on the mm -hmm. social issue. Yeah, by all means, make a party. Uh, I don't think it would work because the people aren't ready for it. In a few decades, mm -hmm. maybe they will be. Uh, but uh, trying to lecture them for, yeah, you know, you're not liberal enough, or you're not neoliberal enough, or you're not democratic enough, you're not republican enough, you're not left wing enough, not right wing enough, it doesn't matter to a poor person. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2019, there were uh, simultaneously there were articles that were saying, oh, you, you know, I thought uh, so from uh, from big commentators. Uh, so some people are saying, oh, yeah, you know, Modi, he's like the second incarnation of, of Hitler. He's such a right wing uh, <laughs> Nazi. And then you had people who were like, oh, I thought Modi would be this, you know, Thatcher or Reagan who would bring right wing economics. But he turned out to be like Bernie Sanders. This was in the <laughs> Wall Street Journal. This was in the New York Times. So, you know, yes, yeah, Schrodinger's Modi. He's you know simultaneously a fascist and a socialist. Uh, you don't know until you open the box. So uh, yeah, that, that's their understanding of uh, non-Western societies. They try mm -hmm. to make it relatable for their audiences, but it's an impossible task because the same debates don't exist. The same values don't exist. The same aspirations don't exist. Very rightly said. And this, this uh, narrowing down of definition into this binary of left and right should definitely stop. Uh, with regards to the Indian context as soon as possible. So, uh, Ruchi, uh, another very interesting thought that comes to mind is uh, about the theory of Marxism, because uh, with regards to in, in context of India, it's, it gains a lot of negative traction from the, in, those in the Indic worldview uh, or those who espouse the Indic worldview. So, uh, Although we do see in the West that it has a connotation of an anti-colonial ideology. So how is Marxism fitting into this uh, anti-colonial versus colonial line of thought in the Indian context? What relevance does it have here? So in the Indian context, Marxism is dead. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> and it was killed by the CPI and CPM, the, by the ones who loved it the most. And the reason for that is that uh, although they called themselves communists, although they called themselves Marxists, uh, they were not uh, true uh, believers in either the theory or the praxis of Marxism. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of the day, what is Marxism? You know, uh, and you know, to differentiate, there's a difference between Marxism, Marxism-Leninism, uh, and Maoism. So okay. Marxism alone is simply a tool a tool of historical analysis, of social analysis, of economic analysis, uh, which at its fundamentals says that the foundations of society, you know, uh, so that could be uh, the state, religion, uh, social uh, relations mm -hmm. are all built on an economic basis. Mm -hmm. That uh, it's only with a certain economic structure that these social constructions come into being. Uh, and they say that, oh, society goes from uh, primitive socialist societies at you know, village uh, level to slave societies, to slave mode of production, to the feudal mode of production, to the mm -hmm. capitalist mode of production, to the communist mode of production, uh, and then history ends. So that's a linear you know, understanding of history, but all, all Western um, understandings, uh, understandings of history are linear within that. Uh, let's say we, we take this uh, Marxist theory to be applicable to India and, uh, you know, and to be correct. Is India ready you know, for that final stage of, uh, of communism or socialism? No, India still has a feudal you know, mode of production or a semi-capitalist, mm -hmm. semi-feudal one. Uh, so in that case, a purist Marxist would say, 
you need to accelerate the transition from feudalism in India to capitalism. And once there is capital accumulation, then people will demand a you know, more socialist state one mm -hmm. way or another, because they say you know, capitalism collapses because of its own contradictions, that capitalism will create uh, inequalities that will make people demand change. Now, what we have in India are not Marxists, even th though they call themselves that, they're Marxist-Leninists. So mm -hmm. Lenin in the Soviet Union or in, you know, when he was in exile in Switzerland and then went back to Russia to create the Soviet Union, he said that you know, it's not enough to just wait for these inevitable, these historical you know, processes to lead to the inevitable consequences. Uh, he said that you need what's called a vanguard party. So mm -hmm. a vanguard party is headed by the intelligentsia or by you know, a few enlightened people. And it's their job to remove the false consciousness of the proletariat that the working class, because they're poor, they don't realize the structural reasons for them being poor. So they need to be guided by a party that will then establish a dictatorship of the proletariat on their behalf. Now, okay. the Indian left, the Indian Marxists, Indian communists arose from that. They're not organic thinkers, you know, rooted in uh, Indian society and ideology. The mm -hmm. CPI was not even founded in India. It was founded in Tashkent uh, by M. N. Roy, who was the golden boy of what was called Comintern, the Communist International, which mm -hmm. was a branch of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. that uh, was tasked with creating affiliate communist parties around the world. And uh, Moscow believed that India was not ready for communism yet. So the CPI, when it was founded, uh, so it was founded by M. N. Roy, who had earlier founded the Communist Party of Mexico, I believe, and it was founded Ooh. in Tashkent. So it was the second party he created. And then uh, the party was created artificially without any grassroots support. Mm -hmm. And without any grassroots intellectualism, there was no indigenization of the theory or the mm -hmm. praxis. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They sent Indian Marxists for mentorship and coaching under the Communist Party of Great Britain, because the Communist Party of Great Britain had a half Indian, half Swedish professor, Rajni mm -hmm. Palmedat, who's still part of the syllabus in India because he's the big daddy of all the CPI members who Nurul Hassan uh, put mm -hmm. into our uh, universities and NCRT in the 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. So Rajni Palmedat was the only expert commenter and had about uh, Indian history and society. And he mentored mm -hmm. all of these uh, early leaders of the CPI. Mm -hmm. Now, during the Second World War, uh, Britain and the Soviet Union were both allies and they were fighting the, uh, well, the Third Reich, so Nazi Germany. So naturally, despite the other parties taking part in quit, quit India movement or demanding independence, the CPI, because it was being mentored by the Communist Party of Great Britain, did not engage in any anti-colonial activity during the 40s because they were instructed both by Moscow and London not to sh uh, shake the boat when the two uh, uh, countries were committed to an alliance and were fighting the, uh, uh, the Germans. Mm -hmm. So as a result, they played no role in the Indian independence movement. But uh, upon, um, upon independence, then the CPI launched a people's war against independent India. So in 1947 to 48, or uh, 48 onwards, uh, they launched the slogan uh, with approval from Moscow because uh, Stalin didn't like Nehru. He thought Nehru tried to flatter him too much and uh, was not <laughs> actually committed to socialism. He just wanted the aesthetics of socialism without mm -hmm. any of the uh, <laughs> practical benefits. So you know, Stalin, in his infinite wisdom, saw through the facade of Nehru, <laughs> who wanted like a posh English version of, uh, of socialism. So uh, the CPI on instructions from Moscow declared people's war in uh, Telangana against <laughs> independent India and fought a civil war and were defeated by the Indian army. And uh, 
after that you know they would pass resolutions so the, the there was the slogan ye azadi jhooti hai so they would say oh you know this is false independence the uh, constitution is a charter of slavery uh, nehru he's just creating a police uh, state a fascist police mm-hmm. state run by brown englishmen which is funny but all of that is true and now you know <laughs> or there's a very different party that believes all of these things uh, <laughs> and uh, then what was funny is that as nehru grew closer to the soviet union and foreign policy moscow instructed them to dilute this so the criticism of the congress and nehru started getting diluted with every party congress so soon they were saying oh india is a semi colonial state but mm-hmm. you know but uh, you know nehru is not you know such a bad guy within a few party congresses they started saying maybe we need a progressive front an alliance you know of the left and the congress to keep you know the fascist forces and communal forces out so basically the cpi was you know remote controlled it was created abroad mentored abroad got its instructions abroad and was not organic uh, did not have grassroots support or any localization of the theory they did what london and moscow told them respectively during different eras Uh, mm-hmm. then in the end uh they did end up making this progressive front with the congress the cpi did at least uh this was after the split so the cpi split up into the cpi communist party of india and the cpim mm-hmm. the communist party of india marxist mm-hmm. and now again this is a misappropriation they call themselves marxist but they're not marxist they're not marxist leninists they were maoists they split from the party because they thought the cpi was too conservative and too pro moscow and beijing was the real communism uh, everyone mm-hmm. else was revisionist so revisionist is a very you know insulting term <laughs> among marxists among the left among communists <laughs> so um, basically anything you don't like is revisionist so uh, china <laughs> is used to call uh, uh the soviet union uh, revisionist and said oh we're building pure communism here the soviet union said oh you know china a uh, revisionist they're diluting the genius of marx and lenin with mm-hmm. their maoist theory albania you know big brain uh, anwar hoja there uh, he said everyone is revisionist except me albania is the only pure <laughs> state and they they went on believing this till 1989 uh so uh after the split so you, you know, the cpi split between the pro moscow faction and the pro beijing faction the pro moscow faction uh, teamed up with uh, the congress i so the congress had also split uh, indira gandhi had taken uh, a chunk of their seats uh, morarji desai was left with the rest and mm-hmm. after uh, lal bahadur shastri passed away mysteriously in tashkent <laughs> again in that uh, special city uh the the uh, the party had put uh, indira gandhi you know in charge as the new prime minister and in order to consolidate her position after splitting the party uh, mm-hmm. she engaged in an understanding with the cpi that the cpi would support her in case of a no confidence mov- uh, motion as long as they got to plant their assets in important places in the media in academia in the judiciary and that was part of that whole committed you know committed mm-hmm. bureaucracy committed media committed bu- uh, judiciary mm-hmm. and uh, nurul hasan nur uh, sayed nurul hasan was the cpm uh, cpi ideologue who was made minister of education and he was uh, he had many disciples romila thapar you know irfan <laughs> habib dn jha all these you know mm-hmm. so called eminent historians and that's mm-hmm. where they uh they all started off you know they learned at the feet of rajni palmedat and then they were given uh, a very privileged position through this you know these machinations mm-hmm. but uh, even if you look at uh, articles and analysis it sees written during those times so for example uh, hiranmay karlekar he's a prolific author and former editor of the pioneer and the hindustan times uh he was a neeman fellow in harvard in 1967 Mm-hmm. so a uh, journalism fellow uh he wrote an article for the harvard crimson so the harvard student newspaper analyzing the 1967 uh lok sabha elections mm-hmm. in which he says that uh, you know there's a cpi there's a cpm but very few voters are going to vote for them because they know that these parties have an extra territorial loyalty that they're more loyal to moscow and beijing than they are to india 
because yeah they don't have a vision they you know they're not fighting elections to you know create a socialist india they're you know foreign agents who are designed there to either make india more pro soviet union or pro china or to facilitate the conditions for an eventual revolution mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, for that they got their funding from abroad, their intellectual support from abroad, and uh, it actually didn't translate into any support of the grassroots <laughs> until there was some sort of indigenization. Okay. So, yeah, so Marxism in India, it never existed in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, we just got this discount, you know, foreign import. So we don't have an Indian Marxism, and in, the people who call themselves Indian Marxists are, to use, you know, everyone's favorite term, revisionists, <laughs> who are discredited <laughs> and not taken seriously by Marxists in the rest of the world. Uh, that apart, uh, we do have Indian socialists like uh, Acharya Narendra Dev or Jayaprakash Narayan, who studied Marxism and used it as an array of many other tools to understand Indian society and develop their own Sarvodai or Antyodai uh, uh, philosophies. So that's what's important rather than being, oh, you know, uh, these left like to fight the Indian left or where, uh, where the purists. So we can, for example, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when Gorbachev was uh, reforming the Soviet Union with Glasnost and Perestroika, Deng Xiaoping in, uh, in China was reforming China to make it more market friendly. You know, he mm -hmm. said, uh, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a white cat or a black cat, uh, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. You know, so mm -hmm. that the goal is more important than the means. Uh, Shekhar Gupta, you know, the editor of the print as a younger uh, journalist, he asked uh, a senior CPI leader that, uh, look, uh, the Soviet Union is changing, China is changing. Uh, when will you look at these reforms for the Indian left front? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said very proudly, the, the communism of the CPI is purer than that of Deng and Gorbachev. <laughs> <laughs> and and th that was basically the end of the line for them. Um, you mentioned uh, Jay Prakash Narayanji and his movement that was the Sampurna Kranti movement and how they uh, initiated a new wave of Indian socialism. So could you tell us a bit more about that and how that is connected to the Indic decolonization that's happening right now? So uh, with that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so Sampurna Kranti was uh, a movement of total revolution. So from the grassroots, uh, creating a political, social, economic, spiritual, moral revolution in mm -hmm. Indian society to you know, uh, unlearn and undo uh, the structures and uh, institutions of the colonial past. Mm -hmm. and dream of something rooted in the popular consciousness, the popular imagination. Mm -hmm. So with that, so Jayaprakash Narayan was quite uh, an unorthodox uh, leader. Uh, so he started off uh, in the Congress, uh, but unlike the other leading luminaries of the Indian National Congress who were you know, the wealthy lawyers or sons mm -hmm. of lawyers who had studied uh, in, in London, Oxford, or Cambridge. Uh, JP studied in the U.S. and mm -hmm. not on, you know, his <laughs> uh, ancestral money or uh, on a scholarship by uh, uh, those trying to cultivate him, but uh, by, you know, working, you know, as a mechanic, working as a fruit picker, and uh, experiencing life as the working class mm -hmm. while studying. Uh, so he started off as a Marxist, he engaged with Marxist theory, but upon returning to India, sought to use it as one of many tools. So at the end of the day, Marxism, like I said, is a tool. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter who created the tool, you know, uh, as long as a tool serves your purposes, it's your tool. You should mm -hmm. embrace it. You should embrace every tool that helps you reach your goals. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, I believe in death of the author, that once an author has uh, published uh, their thoughts, the thoughts don't belong to them anymore. It belongs to those mm -hmm. who believe in them or those who use them or those who identify with them. So he, you know, tried to create a more 
Indian form of socialism based on his experiences and based on his understanding. And uh, it was part of what was called the Sarvodai mo uh, movement. Mm -hmm. So Sarvodai meaning, uh, so Sarv meaning all, Udai meaning rise, uh, mm -hmm. so upliftment, so upliftment of all in society. So after the trauma, you know, the socioeconomic trauma of uh, colonialism, the demoralization mm -hmm. that comes from that, the degradation, dehumanization that comes from that, it was about giving people the tools they needed to mm -hmm. lift themselves out of that and reclaim their dignity. Now, uh, with time, a lot of the uh, Indian socialists uh, left uh, the Congress. So mm -hmm. initially they had an internal faction called the Congress Socialist Party, which okay. Nehru refused to join despite all of his <laughs> uh, Fabian socialism. So they didn't like him very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, during the post-independence era, they split off to create uh, a series of parties. So there was the Socialist Party, there was the Praja Socialist Party, uh, there was the Samyukt Socialist Party. So Jayaprakash Narayan, Acharya Narendra Dev, uh, George Fernandez, these were the big names, uh, Ram Manohar Lohia, mm -hmm. uh, Raj Narayan. So they sought to create an indigenized Indian social welfare model that was not you know, just the unquestioning for, uh, you know, for an imitation of uh, Nehru's Fabian socialism or the CPI's uh, Marxism-Leninism that mm -hmm. uh, you know was uh, theory without praxis. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, uh, it was they gained a lot of respect, but not much um, electoral success. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the 70s, uh, you had the first uh, post independence generation come of age. So people who had never seen British uh, times, they were born in independent India. And in the 70s, they had become adults, you know, they'd uh, finished school, finished university, uh, or uh, started work, uh, working class people, you know, didn't really have uh, the choice to go to university, you know, so people who were mm. now, you know, full members of society, you know, who were voters, who were consumers, who, uh, engaged with society in a meaningful way. So mm -hmm. without the experience of colonial times, all they had seen growing up was essentially single party rule under the Congress. Mm -hmm. And they had grown up seeing famine. They had grown up seeing wars with our neighbors. Uh, they had uh, a very bleak outlook on what independence meant. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in the uh, cultural products of the time that uh, there's a great documentary called India at, uh, at 20 uh, from 1967. Uh, it was made by uh, the government, in fact, where they found people from around the country who were born on, on or around 15th August 1947, who had just turned 20 and asked them what they thought of, uh, of India, what they thought of independence. And you could also already see the frustration growing there, that you had uh, these young people saying, oh, you know, what does freedom even mean? Is it the free freedom to starve, to go hungry, to, to go naked, to live without a roof over your head? Uh, that there was a sense that what was freedom for when it was just notional and it didn't leave to lead to material progress or any sort of upliftment. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, to look at other cultural products of the time, what was doing well in uh, the Hindi film uh, industry in the 70s? It was uh, the rise of the angry young man. Amitabh mm -hmm. Bachchan became, you know, the big superstar who captured everyone's imagination because of the roles he played as a mm -hmm. dark brooding angry young man who was fighting the system and the system was you know corrupt police corrupt government smugglers mm -hmm. foreign agents who were all working together to oppress him the hard-working dock worker hard-working uh, 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 working class guy uh, so this, you know, is again a reflection of what society was thinking. But the fact that these films are what captured people's imaginations shows that there was frustration. And then this was mm -hmm. channeled in uh, uh, movements like Morarji Desai's uh, Navnirman movement, so the refoundation or Renaissance movement in Gujarat. And as I mentioned earlier, the Sampoon Kranti was started in Bihar and then spread around the country. Now, the Sampoon Kranti Andolan, the total revolution movement, was really you know seen by some uh, some scholars as the second independence movement of india 
that okay. we had our first independence movement which, uh, movement, which was the physical removal of our colonizers. So there's no longer, mm -hmm. you know, a white sahib ruling over us, apart from mm. William Dalrymple, of course, you know, he, <laughs> oh, but he's gone to Sri Lanka now to escape COVID. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe stay there. Uh, I'm sure the Lankans know how to deal with people like that better than <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we no longer had the white sahib uh, uh, lording over us, but we did have the brown sahib lording over mm -hmm. us. And without much material progress, without uh, uh, prosperity, without a social contract. And uh, it, what one saw there was not just the second independence movement, but a movement for decolonizing the institutions of state, decolonizing uh, the bureaucracy, police, the whole mentality of governance to make mm -hmm. it more people oriented. Uh, so not just the de uh, decolonization, you can even call it democratization. So full mm -hmm. democratization, which we don't have. We have feudalism with elections. Uh, mm -hmm. So from that movement, now, we saw the rise of a whole new generation of young leaders, mm -hmm. uh, some of whom went on to become state level satraps like uh, of the RJD and uh, uh, the SP. Whereas you also saw the rise of many of the leaders that gained prominence in the 2000s mm -hmm. uh, so, or in the late uh, 90s as well under Vajpayee. Uh, so, the Janta Party that grew out of the uh, emergency. So during the emergency, all of the opposition was locked up. Mm -hmm. uh, and afterwards, uh, well, not all of the opposition, the CPI was not locked up because it cooperated <laughs> with the Congress, CPM was. But uh, the old uh, Bharatiya Jansang, so the predecessor of uh, uh, the uh, BJP, uh, the socialists, uh, George Fernandez, um, and the CPM were jailed. After the emergency, there were elections and we saw the Janta Party Alliance, which was this big tent alliance of uh, various parties. So Moraji Desai's Congress, uh, the Jansang, the Socialists, so Samyuk Socialist Party, and they came to power. And that period from 1977 to 1980 was the birth of modern India that many of the names that are household names today started off their time in uh, in politics during that period. And that mm -hmm. could be Lalu Prasad Yadav, it could be uh, Subramanyam Swami, could be uh, Sushma Swaraj, Pramod Mahajan. Uh, these people started off during that time. Even uh, Mamta Banerjee started off uh, uh, her career by uh, uh, infamously disrupting uh, uh, Jai Prakash Narayan's visit to Calcutta by leading a protest group and she jumped on mm -hmm. his car and uh, mm -hmm. uh, smashed the windscreen and that gained her a lot of praise from Congress headquarters and uh, really got her uh, the head start she needed. So mm -hmm. basically everything we know about politics today uh, arose from the emergency and post-emergency era and mm -hmm. uh, even BJP, when it was founded in 1980, so after the collapse of the Janta Party government, uh, uh, Vajpayee, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, at the uh, foundation ceremony, gave a speech in which he said, Janta Party toot gai, lekin hum Jai Prakash ka sapna ko tootne nahi denge. Jai Prakash koi vyakti nahi, balki kuch mulyo ka naam hai, kuch ardarsho wow. ka naam hai. So, the idea behind the BJP, why is it called the Bharatiya Janta Party? They could have created the Jansang again. They could have refounded the Jansang. They could have uh, you know, created uh, the RSS as a official name for it as well, or created a new one. Mm -hmm. But they took the name of uh, the Janta Party and they said that, oh, this party was created to fulfill the dreams of Jayaprakash Narayan. And that's why you know the party talks about radical social transformation and economic transformation whether it acts on it or not is yet to be seen because uh, no non congress party or alliance has ever got a majority in both the lok sabha and rajya sabha so mm -hmm. uh, it's only the congress that makes constitutional amendments uh, or only, uh, to put it differently only amendments that are acceptable to the congress have ever made <laughs> the constitution very true so, then uh, with that in mind, 
uh, one can understand why the BJP acts in this uh, incrementalist way or you know, acts as a social welfareist party. And in mm-hmm. many ways, is a economically left-wing party. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is something that uh, its own voters get frustrated with because, you know, as I like to say, it's a party that uh, it's this wonderful uh, election winning machine where right wing voters go in and left wing policy comes out <laughs> is released because that's yes. what's acceptable in the Indian polity in the current constitution, in the current system, and even to the broader uh, Overton window, as it's called. Mm -hmm. Uh, They don't really challenge it. They shift it through incrementalism, but uh, they don't have the same zeal. Maybe they're more realistic, they're more pragmatic than JP was, uh, or they learned from uh, past experiences, uh, you know, with NDA1, with uh, Vajpayee, or in 96, uh, uh, the government didn't last for more than a few days, Mm -hmm. uh, that they've become a bit risk averse. Uh, so it's, okay. uh, although founded with this radical transformation in mind, uh, I think uh, experience seven years in power uh, has taught them <laughs> the limitations of what uh, they can and can't uh, do. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's time for them to uh, embrace that uh, if they want to achieve the changes that they're planning, then you need systemic structural change, not mm-hmm. just tinkering with uh, the existing structures. Very true, very true. And uh, the existing structural changes can be changed only through this mass movement that can that the that the party in power that has been elected should initiate, and um, that is that should be the topmost priority of the elected representatives. So, um, Ruchiji, my final question to you is that if you were to summarize, like you said, that uh, the BJP was founded on the principles and it at least it espoused and it proclaimed that it wants to perpetuate the principles of Jay Prakash Narayanji. So uh, what it also espouses is the philosophy of Hindutva. So if you had to summarize what the Hindutva philosophy in actuality is, what would it be? So a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what Hindutva is, even mm-hmm. though it's been defined by the Supreme Court that Hindutva is Hinduism, which is a way of life and is not to be misused as a smear uh, or as a political uh, tool to uh, refer to certain movements. Mm-hmm. Uh, And what I would argue is that uh, Hindutva is a unifying, uh, decolonizing ideology that doesn't belong to one party or one Mm -hmm. movement. It belongs to the people. And you can trace a straight line to the past that Hindutva wasn't born in 1980 with uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party, with the BJP, nor was it even born with uh, the uh, Jansang before it. So Hindutva, you can say that it started with movements for self-determination and self-respect among mm-hmm. the you know, dharmic communities of India. So that could apply to uh, anyone from Chhatrapati Shivaji to Guru Tegh Bahadur to any number of anti-colonial uh, leaders and warriors who were fighting mm-hmm. for an India that was not defined through the lenses and tools of foreigners. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty non-controversial. Every country had this, every country that had a colonial experience had some sort of resistance. Now, what was the unifying factor uh, for Indian rebellions and revolts and wars of independence against Turkish colonizers or Mughal colonizers or uh, British Portuguese? Danish, French colonizers, we didn't have a uh, common language to unite around. So it wasn't, Mm -hmm. you know, linguistic Mm -hmm. ethno-nationalism. It was a certain understanding of, you know, what it meant to be Indian, what it meant to be from dharmic values, and a certain 
sacred geography, as it's called, that India mm-hmm. was defined by you know millennia of certain civilizational history and values, and it was mm-hmm. always brought back. You know, this was always part of it. All anti-colonial movements in India were revivalist in the sense that they sought to erase the uh, humiliation of having uh, their polity, their economy, their society mm-hmm. destroyed by force by foreign invaders who did not identify and did not wish to identify with the values of the people. So it's still a, a bottom-up ideology. So no uh, you know, one party or movement has ownership over it. It belongs to the people. And it has mm-hmm. for, for centuries. And uh, one sees this in various countries. So uh, for example, in Greece, Greece, similar to us, had 400 years of Turkish rule. Now, mm-hmm. they overthrew it in a war of independence. So they, this year, they celebrated 200 years of independence, uh, okay. or at least of the declaration of independence. And they don't look upon that period with nostalgia, like some of our Mughal fetishists do. They even invented a new <laughs> word for it. It's called uh, Turkokratia. So Turkocracy. So Turkocracy mm-hmm. is the 400 years of colonization wherein their people were degraded, where their uh, children were enslaved, uh, forcibly converted. Uh, they lost their language, lost their identity, were not allowed to practice their religion, uh, mm-hmm. had to pay, had to play, uh, pay what was called the blood tax uh, as well. So mm-hmm. that's something that uh, they sought to fight against in their war of independence. And that shapes the understanding of Greece as a modern nation state. Now, uh, Hungary as well. So modern Hungary takes its values from, uh, we uh, suffered uh, the onslaught of Ottoman invasions for centuries, but we fought them off. And, you know, that's how we fought for our dignity and protected our our nation. So various countries have uh, some sort of unifying mythos, some sort of uh, unifying values or historical Mm -hmm. experience. Now, because in India, the uh, colonial periods were associated with uh, an oppression of native uh, spiritual traditions, as well Mm -hmm. as knowledge systems, because uh, it's not just about religious values, it's about the entire, you know, scientific, social, economic uh, organization of society before Mm -hmm the invasions and colonization and afterwards Mm -hmm. uh, that you harked back to that past. So when uh, Shivaji, you know, was proclaimed Chhatrapati, you know, if you look at his proclamations, you know, he talks about, you know, reviving values that this is a country where cows will be sacred. This is a country where slavery will be abolished, uh, things like that. So uh, this was a historical current, which Mm -hmm. today exists in a, very different form to you know what people uh, think it means. So uh, because there hasn't been a, a strong enough definition or defense of the definition by uh, those who practice it, or even uh, by the Supreme Court, it, the definition exists. That's the definitive definition of what Hindutva is. You know, we had Ram Jetmalani go all the way to the Supreme Court with it. Uh, that's forgotten. And instead, uh, there has been uh, the use of the term Hindutva as a boogeyman by certain political uh, actors uh, to vilify the revival of uh, Indian knowledge systems and uh, and heritage and cultural heritage. Now, it's actually quite funny that uh, when uh, they were in jail together during the emergency, uh, the, the CPM, uh, you know, with the uh, Jansung uh, Hindutva types, they realize that oh, these guys aren't actually fascists. They're just a bunch of uh, harmless socialists <laughs> who talk about uh, <laughs> cultural issues. But uh, they, you know, they actually believe in Hindutva more than the Hindutva Vadis. So, you know, the, the way they portray it as this ideology that's going to create uh, fascism and totalitarianism Mm. and is going to erase, you know, minorities or destroy uh, mass. That became uh, the popular understanding of what Hindutva was. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, funnily enough, there were enough voters who actually took that at face value. As a boogeyman, it was like, oh, it's so terrible. Voters were so frustrated in the 90s and uh, in the 2000s that they're like, oh, that actually sounds great. And then they voted these uh, you know, social democrats uh, <laughs> with uh, Hindu, uh, Hindu aesthetics to power and realized that, no, they're, they're not actually the monsters uh, that uh, they were made out to be. And mm-hmm. now they're getting frustrated with them that, hey, you know, why aren't you the <laughs> monsters that we were promised? And this is what happens when you let others define you on their behalf. That uh, even the Hindutva of today of the BJP is a diluted version of what uh, the Jansang believed in, uh, in the pre-emergency era, mm-hmm. which itself is a diluted version of what the Hindu Mahasabha uh, believed in during uh, the uh, pre-independence era. Hmm. And if you go back far enough, so people say, oh, the father of modern Hindutva is uh, uh, Veer Savarkar. Uh, he, you know, was also seen as a mentor to uh, people in the CPI. So there were CPI members who were inspired by uh, the works of Savarkar, so S.A. Dange oh. or uh, M.N. Roy, uh, because it was not seen as incompatible with socialism or communism. So, mm-hmm. for example, mm-hmm. uh, if you look at other unifying anti-colonial ideologies, so pan-Africanism or pan-Slavism. So Yugoslavia was formed by pan-Slavism, that people who are connected by uh, the Slavic heritage, Slavic language family, uh, mm-hmm. they you know, have a right to uh, create a state of their own instead of being mm-hmm. various provinces in the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the Ottoman Empire. And uh, that's how Yugoslavia was formed. and this pan-Slavic ideology was the foundation of the state. It was the foundational identity of the state and it took various forms. Yugoslavia was a kingdom, a pan-Slavic kingdom, and then went on to be a pan-Slavic communist uh, federal republic. Mm -hmm. The two can coexist, the two can be built on each other. So the idea was that you know the people you know in there in the, in the independence movement what were they fighting for they wanted ram rajya that's what gandhi promised them you know they wanted uh, revivalism of you know a golden age of sovereignty where they you know saw themselves reflected in the state so that could be pan slavism in eastern europe it could be pan africanism in uh, in africa it could be bolivarism in uh, latin america mm-hmm. uh, it could be arab nationalism like uh, nasser uh, of egypt uh, propounded uh, and in india that was hindutva that just means the current of uh, public sentiment against foreign ideologies foreign institutions that mm-hmm. seek to de- define and oppress uh, the values and aspirations of the people so it's compatible that you need to have that foundational identity that you know the british raj was divided on the basis of religion you have mm-hmm. to accept it. it's not that uh, integral india so akhand akhand bharat as it's called was not divided uh, because you know we were being punished for not being secular the british raj was divided into a muslim homeland and a hindu homeland if you acknowledge that, you at least have the basis of identity to create social cohesion and then build the rest. You can have a you know, Hindutva communist uh, republic if you want. <laughs> you know, th- there were people who believed in that at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's just the foundation. And on top of that, you can build a modern uh, political uh, system. And that can be social democratic. It could be a kingdom. It could be uh, communist. The point is, it's about self-respect and uh, about reclaiming the dignity that was stripped of people and their culture and their practices and their knowledge systems. And the kind of Hindutva that exists today, you know, in the form of the BJP is a very mild version of even that, that at best it thinks of religion neutral laws and uh, uh, equal rights for equal citizens, you know, is still hard for them to push. You know, they still want to have uh, a minority ministry. They still seek the patronage or, or seek to cultivate patronage over minorities mm-hmm. uh, uh, because that's politically expedient. So mm-hmm. they're, yeah, they're not exactly extremists. They're, they're moderates today.
Wow, and that was really an exhaustive definition of Himalaya. So thank you so much for explaining it to us. That was really enlightening. Ruchirji, thank you so much for taking out the time for this interview. It was truly an honor to have you on our platform and dhanyawad for joining us. Thanks so much for inviting me. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to interact with you. You had great questions and I hope the, uh, the audience uh, enjoys our conversation and oh, takes these ideas forward. You. They will tell you. Like I said, the ideas, you know, once they've left the mouth or the, the pen of the writer, they belong to you. They belong to the, the listeners. They belong to the uh, readers. So mm -hmm. take these forward, build on them and dare to dream of the future. Like Thomas Sankara said in Burkina Faso, invent the future. No one else is going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Very rightly said. And with this, we thank you once again for joining us. Uh, Dhaniawad, Gigi. Dhaniawad, thanks so much. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhaniawad, Namaskar.